Okay, thank you, Sebastis. I just want to be clear on one point. The only disagreement in the, in the working group was over what we would order for lunch, and Sebastis just happened to come in at that particular moment. It was utterly harmonious for the rest of the day. So this is correct. Uh, this event is part of a one-and-a-half-day working group on microgrids. We hope to produce a short white paper, which will get posted on the TISED website. And we're very keen to get input from yourselves and anybody else which you can do on the TISED website, or you can email to tysedmcgill.ca, and we're very keen to get uh, input. Uh, everybody has got an agenda, and you've also got the bios of the speakers, so I'm going to move forward rapid fire here and not waste much time on formalities. We will just try and get through this uh, very uh, noble panel as quickly as possible and hopefully leave a bit of time for questions, but again, if we do get behind and you aren't able to ask your question, please submit it on the web. So with that, I will no, move forward. Okay, so my obligation here is just to uh, give a bit of background information, what in fact is a microgrid, what are we talking about? So these are three uh, definitions. The first two come from uh, experts in the field, groups of experts. The first one from Seagray, I'm the, I am the convener of that group. And you'll see that they have two common features, and uh, this extends to many other definitions too, which is a microgrid is a locally controlled power system, and it can function connected or islanded, uh, disconnected from the grid. So uh, you'll hear a lot of talk about remote systems and whether or not they're microgrids and so on. You can see where one of the points of contention comes up immediately. For our purposes here, we can take a pretty general uh, position and just say microgrids are uh, small, locally controlled systems. This other definition at the bottom is a really important one coming from NYSERDA in New York. It's important because New York State is pretty much ground zero nowadays for microgrid development and demonstration, and I will talk a little bit more about that. But uh, you can see from their definition that it's coming from a pretty different place. It's all motivated by resilience, and protecting uh, public uh, services that are considered critical, et cetera. And this thinking came very much out of, hurricane, out of Superstorm Sandy. And uh, we will talk a little bit more about that. One other definitional issue to cover is what's the difference between reliability and resilience? There are a number of different uh, metrics for reliability that are used for power systems. You can see some there. Uh, mostly there's prob probabilistic, they're defined by IEEE or some other authority, and they are probabilistic. If we sat here and waited for the power to go out, measured how long it was out, and sat here for multiple years, we could get a good estimate of these indicators. Resilience is much more different. It's more of a general concept. It is, are you well prepared for an emergency? How well do you perform during it? And particularly, how well were you able to recover afterwards? And when common definition is this one coming from the Obama administration. So uh, most of the discussion here is going to cover this resilience period that I mentioned, which started in 2011 with the great tsunami and earthquake in Japan. So I feel obligated to say a little bit about uh, what were microgrids all about before then. It started around the turn of the century, the modern microgrid development and uh, coincided with the signing of the Kyoto Protocol, and as I said, ended with uh, the Great East Japan Earthquake, so I like to call this Kyoto to Fukushima, and almost all the discussion here will be post-Fukushima. There were some uh, development of microgrids in this early period here, mostly island systems, but you can see there in the upper center that uh, during the, this early period, up until about 2008, Japan was really a leader. And it was no accident that the Kyoto Protocol was signed in Japan. Japan was an early mover. The big motivation in this era really was uh, higher renewable penetration. And again, it switched dramatically after 2011. After that period, you can see activity in a lot of uh, different countries with different projects and demonstrations. I particularly noted, note this one in the bottom right, Spiders, which was a U.S. military program. And in fact, the U.S. military is the one institution that's embraced microgrids as their default. Typically, uh, military bases are in remote places with bad power quality, and these are people that really want reliable power. We really wouldn't have a lot of faith in a military that 
stop working when the power went out. And obviously, if you were invading, you would make sure that would happen. We won't talk much about military applications here, but it's definitely something to bear in mind. This is a short list of the different motivations for microgrids. Reduce cost, no surprise. Uh, reduced emissions, I've already mentioned that. Increasing renewable penetration. And reliability and resilience, I've already mentioned that. To make this slide a bit less boring, I've put these two graphics. The pie chart there comes from Navigant, which maintains a big data database of ongoing microgrid projects. So these are all the projects in the world that are in some stage of development. It's about 16 gigawatts, and as you can see, North America is by large the, far, by, large the, the by far the largest market. Asia Pacific is second, and uh, Japan is 16% of that, uh, pretty much the second largest market. Less activity in Europe, although it's coming back a little bit. So down here in the bottom left are some of the uh, little more unusual, surprising uh, motivations. One is new markets. Uh, are there going to be prosumers, individuals that uh, compete in markets uh, as both suppliers and uh, uh, consumers, et cetera? And uh, this one uh, note there on buffering, one potential for microgrids, one kind of service that it might offer to the grid, is buffering variability in renewables. You will have heard a lot about concerns for uh, the effect of variable renewable resources on the traditional grid. So one way to think about this problem or to mitigate it would be if that kind of variability could be mitigated locally. And a microgrid is in a great position to do that. It can integrate a renewable resource with controlling its loads as well as uh, other non-variable resources. And down in the bottom left, I mean, there is just a simple desire for independence, community scale systems, and so on. Surety is a very nasty word that's used by the US military to mean uh, reliable supply. Bottom right is what's going on in the US market. This is a forecast uh, that comes uh, from Green Tech Media, and they predict about four gigawatts uh, by uh, 2020. And we're ahead of that schedule right now. So as I said, what happened in New York and the other New England states during Superstorm Sandy was very influential. So I wanted to show one example of a microgrid uh, that had a big effect, and it's this one here at New York University. Uh, underneath an uh, open square on 4th Street near Washington Square, underneath this uh, square area that you can see pictured, there is an underground CHP facility that serves multiple buildings. They've got a small control system underground, tiny. It looks like people working in a submarine. And I was very impressed when I saw that. But now that I've seen uh, the underground city in Montreal, you know, this is Bush League stuff by your standards. And uh, everything is maintained underground. And this small elevator is the way in which they bring in all spare parts and so on to maintain the system. And this is what uh, the two turbines underground look like there. OK, so as I said, this had a huge effect on New York. And one of the outcomes is the New York Prize. New York Prize is a three-stage public policy effort. In the first stage, there were a large number of feasibility studies, about 83 in all. They're on the NYSERDA web page. They're about 100 pages each. So that's your reading list and homework following this event. They've just moved to the second stage in which they've picked these 11 projects that will get a $1 million grant for a more careful <clears throat> evaluation. You can see that nearly all of these are public agencies or other uh, public infrastructure that's considered critical. And all of this New York pro program is like that. And you can tell it's all built around emergency preparedness and resilience. One notable uh, outlier here is that Amtrak one, three from the bottom. So if you think about it, um, disintegration or separation of the grid and local control, one way to think about it is customers becoming isolated. Another way is infrastructures. Following a large outage, a lot of the problems are not directly related to power loss. They're related to infrastructure failure. So you do see some instances like this a commuter railroad that they're trying to make it more resilient by having its own power supply so that it can still function in that kind of an emergency. So that's it for me in my brief introduction. 
As you can tell, Gretchen is uh, next up, so I will turn over the floor.